Welcome to Saints on Cinema. I am Tim Wild, and joining me tonight is Josh Edlo and Ashley Preston Bowden. Of three of us together, and Josh remembered <laughs> our uh, video recording session tonight. Isn't that exciting? It's exciting. Yeah, because we're ready to live, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, this episode is going to be um, interesting because we just realized just this afternoon that the three of us had watched what we're going to talk about, but it's not going to be. I don't think it's going to be a controversial conversation, but it's definitely not going to be our <laughs> lighthearted conversation we've ever had on this show. Uh, very nice content. Um, a very serious show, and it was kind of an eye opener for me. We're going to talk about that. Um, but specifically, Josh has some, some particular feedback about this show. And we are talking tonight about the Waco series from 2018, currently streaming on Netflix. And uh, I. I was going to say right here, I didn't really know the story of what happened in Waco because this was what, 1991, right? Three. 93. 93. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was uh, 13 at the time. And I remember hearing little things. I was new in Utah and I remember hearing little like, stories about this kind of stuff with uh, polygamous compounds. There were several of them in the 90s that this kind of stuff was going on. And I didn't follow it as a kid and I never went back and researched it as an adult if I can be called an adult and uh so I didn't know the story so this was a six six episodes right or eight I think it was six. eight episodes eight six. Episodes. Was it six? Was eight it was six <laughs> it was eight. That was six I thought it was six I swear it was six okay. the tiger thing was Look eight but six episodes and or whatever it was and uh I honestly didn't know how it was going to end I really didn't and I love how We'll get into it. We're going to break down every episode or anything, but the, the opening of the show has, uh, it shows the shootout, the beginning of the shootout as the, as the opening, which is the tease for like three episodes later, not the end of the show. So I really had no idea where it was going because I didn't know the full story. Now, I did have this, this polygamy, this economy, or economy, um, facility, temp, or temp, whatever they were, mixed up with that other one that happened like 10, 15 years later. And you're talking about Warren. You're talking about Warren Jeffs, the one in uh, Colorado Arizona. City. Yeah. Um, so that's what I thought this was about, and it wasn't. <laughs> no. So a very different story from what I understood. So I was just hooked, and I burnt. I burned through it in one and a half night. I, I had the last two episodes. I watched the next night, but holy cow, I was sick to my stomach watching it. But I was just entrenched in uh, curiosity. And I was excited a little, not excited like it was like, enjoyable, like entertaining, but I was just, I was, I was just, just so invested in what was happening because I was knew it was based on real stories. And the, and it opens up saying which several novels or, you know, the biographies or whatever they were written or they were based off of. And it follows two stories that we'll talk about, but the main one is um, the kid that gets away, it's his story. Thibodeau. Mm -hmm. Thibodeau. And I didn't know he survived. I didn't know that was, his, he wrote the book, one of the books. And the other one was the, the FBI investigator played by um, whoever it is that plays uh, General Zod in Man of Steel. <laughs> Michael Shannon. Yeah. Now, I had no idea that's who he was until the last episode. I was like, I swear this guy's familiar. I looked him up and there he was. So I've never seen him with hair that wasn't like General Zod. So I didn't... <laughs> I didn't know who he is. Now, that made me want to go back and rewatch it because he's so good. Anyway, yeah. that aside, um, I'm just going to give my impressions. I'm going to let Josh kind of lead the discussion because he had, he had a, thought, a lot of thoughts. But I just want to say, I was really hooked, like I said. It, was, it had its ups and downs, and you could kind of see, I mean, as members of the church, we have a lot of uh, opinions and discrimination based on our history with polygamy and things like that, but in a situation like this, it's it, and, and the, the accusations of being a cult, things like that. That you see these people who are like some saw brainwashed, and other people looking at the, the members of this congregation as being just devout. It was interesting to see their different reactions to the different situations and their loyalty going up and down as the stress of the compound went up and down, and how the outside world looked at them as either hostages or a cult or just radicals who are gonna commit suicide, just all that stuff. Just the the emotions 
the perspectives the with the FBI, the outside parents, the media, even that one crazy, not crazy, but that one radical guy on the radio, and then the members and just how they felt about everything. That was such an intriguing, like a character study of all these different perspectives as the show went on. That's what was exciting to me. Not, I don't mean like entertainment, just to get that clear. Because I didn't know what happened until the very end. Um, that's what I really liked about the show. I think it was a phenomenal, not a documentary, but it was a, or a, a dramatization. Very well shot, very well written very well uh, paced the way they did each episode. Each episode ended and I just couldn't wait to know what was going to happen next and it wasn't all like cliffhangery, but it was really good tension. And I wasn't ready for what happened at the very end. I, I was shocked by the time it got to the very end and then it, that jumped me into a lot of research afterwards. But um, just going to say overall, I loved it. It was so well done. And I, I re re or told several other people, even a couple years ago that this came out, I never really heard about it. I told a lot of people, it's really good. It's really, really good. And if you're watching this and you haven't seen it, definitely go watch it. And we're going to spoil here. But um, before we get to the spoiler section or whatever, I don't know if Josh has things he wants to talk about, but phenomenal show. Phenomenal. It's very well done. That's my thoughts about it. So, Josh, do you want to take yeah, so, Ashley's impressions so, first? No, um, you don't do my first. What's that? I said, don't do mine first. <laughs> No. So here, here's the thing, and, and, and uh, Ashley and I have actually had some conversation a little bit about this already, so I kind of have an idea what she's going to say a little bit. Um, but my, so I do remember the Waco situation from 93. I've always been very fascinated with cult leaders and serial killers. I don't know what that says about me, but I've been very, me too. Been very yeah. interested in them from the from as long as I can remember. And so when that happened, I remember watching the news when it was going on. And I remember the, the news painted them as if they were these this like militant group that was like shooting it, you know, at FBI agents and ATF stuff. So I, you know, and I was a little kid. I mean, I was 93, I was 12 years old. So I had no idea, you know, what was really going on. And it wasn't until later, because I remember when they all, when everybody died in there. And a few days after that, things started coming out like, oh, you know, actually maybe it wasn't. And there was like a bit of an investigation uh, as to what was going on. Um, and again, you know, when you're when you're 12 or 13, I guess that doesn't really matter that much. But I do remember the things coming out like, you know, that, you know, women and children had been had been murdered, you know, in there and, and had died. And the thing that is, is uh, that was so frustrating to me was the like i recognize that david koresh was a was a crazy person <laughs> and you know uh he was just a charismatic crazy guy who thought he was a messiah not the messiah but a messiah and, and they all uh, and they all followed him devoutly um i did not know that his main guy was like a a professor of theology or was studying to be a professor of theology i thought that was really interesting um but I think to me, what really stood out in this was the government uh, po po uh, politics and how it had an adverse effect and how people died that did not need to die. People who generally, I mean, if you read the story, you understand that that the Branch Davidians, yeah, they were they were strange and David Koresh was icky, you know, but they weren't bothering anybody. No, you know what I mean. They, they weren't doing anything other than. You know, they were, I mean, obviously there was stuff going on within there that needed to be investigated, but as far as the ATF like, goes, and, um, yeah, and like the marrying of young kids, yeah, yeah, although, yeah. Mo although most of the stuff that they were doing, almost all of it technically was legal by Texas law at the time. Doesn't mean it was right. I'm just saying that's what it, it but was. But the conflict from what I understood that was the statutory situation where you could marry someone who was 14 but you had to have their consent but the consent was coming from other men who were you know potentially brainwashed by the theology of the group and so that sure. I think that was where the conflict was yeah. um so but but my my point was was like what what frustrated me so much was um clearly the branch davidians did not start the fight 
You know what I mean? They were not the ones you shot first. The FBI and the ATF were. And the ATF- Based on, they, based on what? Go ahead and explain that. The show they, showed them shoot the dogs and that triggered the- Right, shootout. right. But, but that's what I'm saying. They are the ones, you, how do I put this? Like, um, so I had a psychology professor <laughs> once who, who, who talked about gun violence, right? And he said that studies have shown, and I'm a gun owner, so don't take this like I'm anti-gun because I'm definitely not, okay? But I had a, uh, the professor said that um, guns, the studies have shown that guns lead to violence just as much as cigarettes lead to cancer. And so what I mean by that is if there's a gun present, the likelihood that a gun will be used is going to be, you know, exponentially, uh, it, the, it, the greater likelihood that they're going to be used. I mean, you have a bunch of people in there who expect that they knew that they were going to expect somebody to come, right? They knew that they had these weapons and they start shooting. What do they expect to happen? You know what I mean? That, that's, that's my point. And on top of that, also the ATF is not, they were there to look for three things, alcohol, tobacco, firearms. They're not there to go and check about polygamy. They're not there to go check about, potential, you know, statutory rape. That's not what they're there for. They're there strictly for a firearms charge. And all of that happened because of this long history of the ATF screwing up these things like Ruby Ridge and different places. I mean, it showed that at the beginning, right? Like some of the first things you see of the ATF is this situation that happened in Ruby Ridge in Idaho, where, mm -hmm. you know, they right. thought, where they thought that this guy was part of the Aryan nation when he really wasn't, he was just a homeschooled really right wing guy, which is like half of Wyoming and Indiana and, and, and Idaho, you know what I mean? And so he just, you know, and then they, it ends up with somebody, somebody's wife getting shot, you know what I mean? And so, uh, I just, I was just so frustrated about, you know, you have a guy there who this negotiator who obviously sees what the problem is is trying to tell them let's try to work this out and they were just guns a blazing and everything that, that he was trying to stop came to pass and it's just so frustrating when you see that and you see them agitating them i mean i think the best the, the best line he had was you are you know you have a guy in there who is irrational you're doing things to to make him crazy and then you wonder why he's not dealing with you rationally right like it just, it made no sense to me. And it frustrated me to no end that here a bunch of people died that I don't feel, I don't believe needed to die all because what? Because the government just thought that they were weird. You know what I mean? Right. See, and that, the whole show, but I mean, so are you just frustrated mostly about the, the history and the situation? Is that what yeah, I, I think I'm frustrated. Well, now let me also back up though. I think, I think that this story, and I've never, I haven't read, read either of those books, but I've read a lot of articles and different things about David Koresh. And I think the one criticism I would have is I felt like this, this show painted David Koresh to look a lot more normal and a lot more nice than he really was. You know what I mean? Like if you look at him, if you hear about stories about what he was really like, there are lots of stories about the kids being beat every day, minor infractions. He ruled with an iron fist. Most of the people in there thought he was kind of a jerk, but they believed in his in his theology. You know right. I mean? He clearly, um, you know, and if you listen to some of the actual footage of him talking, you know, he was a rambling crazy man. You know what I mean? He was not. He was not normal, and they made him look. I felt too normal. So. All right, so we yeah we just played musical chairs on the the screen real quick, but <laughs> so I want to go back a little bit on a couple of things that you were talking about you that you brought up. Um, okay. One thing, and I really liked this about the story, which I didn't realize was accurate until I did research after the show. But you mentioned how some of the the characters were based on real people that made it interesting that they weren't just like mindless followers of a radical and i think a lot of times when we think about these kind of cults that's kind of what we think about they were just kind of they were raised into it or they're just uh, just oppressed and they're they're limited in their education and they're kind of like kind of like how you know 
people used to treat slaves back in the 1800s they like would limit their access to knowledge and things like that so in culture so they couldn't like learn and think for themselves that's how i kind of look at people in these kind of you know what they call cults now when they show the first uh, meeting that they show they have um, they have them kind of going around and talking to each person kind of bearing their testimony in a way where they're like okay you know me and you used to be a doctor or whatever and you used to be you study theology or whatever and it really gave these characters a solid background that these weren't just like crazy people that they were just they were good people that like knew different things from different backgrounds but still were still devout to his religion i found that really intriguing when i found out later that that was accurate that those stories were real and you had the one main the main bald guy that died I guess spoilers. <laughs> Again, I guess right. but the guy the, that the, the guy that was shot earlier, he was one, and then there's the other guy that was the main follower that ended up having your shooting uh, um, um, David. So those two guys, and then you have the kid, because you're kind of following the story of the kid who's kind of being exposed slowly to the different aspects of the religion. Were you going to say something, Ashley? Yeah, so just clarifying. So you have the father-in-law, which was the bald guy, and then you have Steve, who was the friend who shot him. And then you have Tib, who was that kid. So I just, I'm throwing names in there so I don't lose track of what yeah, we're talking about. And then there was, also, there was also the guy who clearly had a law background who was advising yes. uh, as to what law issues that they could possibly have if the ATF or the FBI came in, which is why, which, why Tib ended up marrying Michelle. Who was, who but was he there. went to Harvard Law, but did he ever pass his bar? I don't That's... know if he did or not. Okay. Yeah. But I think, but that was kind of cool because he, um, sorry. Okay. Um, because that, that came up several times where he was saying, he told them, uh, you know, they were at the end when they were, they were kind of at the end of the rope and they were like, we're going to need a lawyer. And he's like, no offense, you know, because he's like, no, I, I get it. This is not the same situation. But just understanding what their options were throughout the story, um, when they were doing the negotiations and the during the, the what do you call it? It's not a hostage situation. What was the the standoff? Negotiations. I mean, yeah, negotiation standoff. Yeah. So I mean, during all that stuff, they kept going back and forth on you know when do we surrender? When do we come out? What do we wait for? What are we actually facing? Who's going to get arrested and prosecuted? Are the women and children going to be? okay or if we get out are we gonna be able to see them again are they gonna take the children all these different aspects about the law came out and they were it was interesting that they did have someone on the inside that had a mind that could learn about some or talk about some of that stuff that gives the audience an understanding of the stakes and also their mindset about what was going on and so when they started threading some of those conversations in which is really intriguing because i want to know how how detailed that was how real it was or if that was just script writing because you know, Fib, Tib, whatever his name was, he wasn't necessarily in a lot of those conversations with the, the hierarchy of the group. He was just, you know, trying to take care of the kids and or the, the, the women and doing his regular chores, trying to keep things running or whatever. But a lot of those scenes he wasn't even in. So he gets out and writes a book. You have the negotiator writing his book. Where were some of these details coming from or did they kind of make them up? That's what I found interesting. We don't necessarily know an answer to that, I guess, unless we read the books. <laughs> So, Josh, that's your assignment. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, that's what I really liked about how the show was done because it was written in a way that you were really understanding their situation and where, and like I said, their perspectives. It was a great character study, like I said. But you mentioned, Josh, how he was written but kind of a nicer guy. And I think you, I think they did, I agree with you. He was probably written a lot nicer than he really was with some of the other facts. But they did show that darkness coming out of him a few times i'm not talking about darkness judging his religion or beliefs or anything i'm talking about him as a person there were times when he did get did get really strict there were times that he did like when he yelled at them that they were eat, feasting while they went during when they should be mourning things like that there were a few moments where he saw the uh him being a dictator almost over this group instead of this loving you know um priest or messiah for them you know what i mean there was several times that he kind of came out there were several times he got defensive several times he lost his cool talking to the negotiators when the other guy who, who was the guy that was doing the conversations later it wasn't the the ball guy but it was the other one that was he was going up and down on if he how much he still agreed with david who was steve? that steve was it steve the, the theology steve, guy yeah 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 
he, um, that was that was really interesting where he was trying to get some ground with the negotiators and they and they were like you know he's our best shot because we can see some some detachment from the beliefs from him and then that's when uh, they would get on the phone and he like yell or yell at him and hang up you could see where he was getting to the end of his rope but i really i, I mean what do, what do you think about that because i did see some of that that frustration and hostility coming through and even that oh even that the weird part when he was having sex and he stops because he was like enjoying himself it. yeah i was like that's really interesting that it's it's not it's not necessarily painting an accurate picture about him necessarily i don't know but you're like maybe he really did feel that this was what he was taking upon he was taking sex as an our carnal pleasure as a burden on himself for the for the other men and for the women I don't know. It's it, they they kind of played it in a way you're you're not necessarily sympathizing, but you can almost see that he's it's there's more to it than just some weird creep in a cult and they just come in and take him out. That was that's interesting. You know when you when you think about that. So I, I draw back to um, I read the book Helter Skelter about Charles Manson and the guy who wrote that was the uh, was the prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi. And they asked him. Actually, you got excited right there. Uh, I just I wanted to read that book. So. Oh, it's a, yeah. it's a it's a good one. It's cool. it's, a, it's a seminal book on Charles Manson if you're interested in him. But yeah. Um. So later on, Vincent Bugliosi, I think is how, how you say it. Um. He he did a uh, an article and they asked him because if you don't understand Charles Manson, his, the theory behind it was. Charles Manson believed there was going to be a race war. It was during the civil rights movement. He believed there would be a race war where the blacks would, would fight the whites and that would kill them. And then later, there, because the blacks had never been really involved in world government, somehow Charles Manson and his people would end up becoming the ones who ruled the world. And so the idea was, was that he had had them go and do these murders and paint all the, you know, paint in blood all the things that they did because then that would somehow start the race war. That people would believe that it was someone like the Black Panthers that did that and it would start this race war. And they later asked Vincent, they asked him, do you think that Charles Manson really believed that? And he said, no, he's too smart. He's just a con man, but his people believed it, right? It, it seems as though David Koresh did believe he was a messiah. Yeah. And so it does, It's he was not a con man in that way, you know? Although I do love the line that, uh, that the uh, the negotiator said to Steve when he's like, you know, how is it that all these guys who they become cult leaders and then all of a sudden they find these revelations where they have to marry everybody's wives and have sex with them? Like, it's just like, yeah, it's really true, isn't it? That really yeah. is kind of the first thing to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why that scene where he's having sex because because uh, there's the scene where Fib and the girl that he married and that was to like break down some of the legality issues they were having where she or he was like he congratulated him where it went on the, on the altar or at the altar when when he played his guitar at the <laughs> she was walking down the island and everything it's like okay but after he did after he pronounced a man and wife like it was just like he didn't know what to do because he understood the rules and so and then they was like you can kiss her now and so it was the weirdest little awkward never touched each other kiss and didn't know what their relationship was going to be in the future and then later mm -hmm. that night, they were like kind of happy to be married. But then Dave was like, well, you know, you're not allowed up in the dorm. So he's like, okay. And then he takes her up. You're like, oh. Yeah. You know? Time to consummate your marriage. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Little, like, little things yeah. like that, you're just like, is he just playing on these people for his own selfish needs or desires? Or did he really believe this stuff? And that, like you said, he's very charismatic. And this, this is the next question I have for you guys. When it showed him doing his sermons, and there were several scenes of the first in the early episodes, he was very persuasive, very persuasive. And I, and again, I wonder how much of this was actually written by the people that were actually, or I guess that's the only one that could have written about what he, what he witnessed. That and the other guy, there was that other, I don't know if this was another book, but the other guy that was infiltrating them, the guy that they caught with a gun in that one scene, um, he was the one that was, you know, neighbor pretending to be a farmer. Oh, yeah. John Leguizamo's character. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. He, okay. um, that he was looks terrible, by the way. Yeah. He does. He looks I, like, so it took me, it took me, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Like, yeah, no, that was yeah. weird. 
but I don't know if he had a lot of writings about, but he was there witnessing a lot of those sermons as well. So my question for you guys, during those sermons where he was very persuasive, very charismatic, did that make you feel uncomfortable or I don't know, did it, was it like kind of a creepy thing, like watching him? Cause you, you're thinking, cause this was early in the show too, where you didn't really know how his character was going to be played, that he was either, that he was manipulating these people or he was, did he really believe it? That it was just that, that good, you know, or, or you know what I mean? My personal opinion is that when you have a specific goal, like in his mind, he really Is it really dying? (laughs) (laughs) That's so sad. Okay. Let me make sure you're back, Ashley. Are you back? Am I really gone? You were. Yeah, we heard when you... (laughs) (laughs) Okay, you're good. Okay, go ahead. Ah! Okay. Okay. So it's like... Okay. So when he... He really honestly felt like he was a messiah. And so I feel when you were that charismatic and you have this common goal, you're going to do all of your natural gifts that you have. And he's going to use them for his goal. His ultimate goal, like getting people (laughs) to... Did I freeze again? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, his ultimate goal to what? to just kind of get everyone on his side so then they could all be together and he's going to use his natural gifts to do that and a charismatic person can literally you know who winston churchill said like having tact and charisma it's like telling someone to go to hell and they look forward to the trip you know it's like he had that gift that he could do that and so i i feel that he was just playing what he could for his goal and he didn't really care if he people if if he was speaking his truths or not basically is what i'm saying i i think that more came out his his confidence later on when they realized that was was the name of the whoever the name of the guy was that pretended to be a farmer the guy next the neighbor guy he um when he was infiltrating and they realized they said well i don't know who he is but he's not a farmer but david was so confident he's like well let's bring him in because and there's nothing because i know that he was here for a reason and I can I can get him. I can convert him. And he was so confident that even though the other people were like, dude, just get him out of here. And he's like, no, he's the, there's a reason he's here and I'm gonna figure it out. And then he started you know, learning about his his background, his mother and stuff. And, they, and then at the party, or at the, was it the wedding? I remember what I was there. The baby. wedding. Yeah. And they were all having a good time and he like got him, you know, he got him to start dancing and relax. And he was, well, I don't know if he actually got him to, but he invited him to <laughs> kind of cut right. to for that but all of that that whole speech and that that um wrapping him in there played out later when that guy tried to stop the assault and it was just it was interesting how someone going there to in- investigate and and infiltrate to discover what a threat they were what their weapons were and 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 scouted out ended up kind of being a little curious about the theology as well and you saw his conflict. I don't, again, I don't know how accurate that is in real life, but it was really, it, it really showed the 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 charm and the, like you said, confidence of of Gresh. I thought that was really, I thought it was really well played. And it took several episodes to kind of to kind of lay that out. But, uh, yeah. What'd you think of that, Josh? What'd you think of of the way he was portrayed, Gresh? I thought David Gresh. Yeah, just like his sermon, just his, just his, uh, the early stuff where you saw him as the Messiah doing his thing as opposed to later on during the hostage stuff or the negotiations. Well, I think, I think that was probably an accurate portrayal because yeah, it's a little weird, but at the same time, you can see how charismatic he really is. I mean, that's, that's one trait of all of these, these cult leaders, right? Is that they're obviously charismatic, otherwise people wouldn't follow. So I think they played that pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, I loved that the John Leguizamo or whatever, how you say it, Leguizamo's character, because it just goes to show I- anybody susceptible to it. You know what I mean? I mean, cause you see what he did, right? Like what he did was he preyed on his weakness. He found out stuff about him personally. I think it was something to do with his mother. His mother. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. And then he, and then he, 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 he comes in and he sees that, he prays on that, he relates to that and kind of pulls at his heartstrings. 
and then brings him in. You know what I mean? And, out the, col- the whole concept was what a Messiah was. Not that there's the Messiah, but a mm-hmm. Messiah is someone that is a messenger or whatever from God or whatever, someone that reunites right. with God or whatever. And he was pointing, right. this person's Messiah was this person. This person's Messiah was this thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And your Messiah is your mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and it's interesting because um, you also find that there are certain traits of somebody who ends up in a cult, you know, and one of those things are, you know, they're searching for something, you know, they're ser- searching to be a part of something greater, they have some internal conflict, and you could see that in that character, right? He had some internal conflict, and um, you know, I think that the the other thing that, but again, uh, the thing that I that I took away from it was you know these people were really not bothering anybody i mean the the most telling thing was when they talked to the sheriff and the sheriff said anytime you had a problem with the branch davidians he just went and talked to him and that was it yep you know what i mean and it was over and um so the sheriff was kind of the voice of reason throughout the whole thing and he was like quieted and like they didn't even you know consult yeah. him or he wasn't even a part of it for like four episodes until towards the very end they're like okay you get in and try and talk to him and it was like mm-hmm. why, why wasn't he involved the whole time like he's the one that had a relationship hey. with them yeah it, it didn't make sense i mean the way that they went about it about it was so bad and you could see you could also see how the politics of it playing out right they didn't want to lose face they didn't they didn't want you know they were already on the ropes because of this uh, ruby ridge stuff so they were trying to get a good photo op so that that way they could show that they're what they're doing is relevant so they could continue to get funding so they could continue to have the atf out there bill clinton at the time was talking about abolishing it you know what i mean and so all that stuff together just was this big melting pot of mess that caused this big problem and they don't want to, the big thing, they don't want to, there are a set of precedents that like, if you hold out long enough, like, we're not going to just go in and be nasty about it. And that is almost like the same as the, the policy about right. ter- or terrorists that you don't give into their demands with the U.S. So. Well, and at the same time, like, I think for me, the, the most grotesque, the most grotesque thing that, that I saw was the time when the, the FBI director and the, the bad FBI guy, I, I can't remember his Mitch. name. Mitch, yeah. When Mitch and the FBI director go to Janet Reno and they're trying to get approval to go in there and the things that they're saying, like, oh, well, yeah, we can use uh, we can use tear gas because yeah. they, they don't make gas masks small enough for kids. So they'll all come right. running out. Right. Like, you know, are you crazy? They were like, lying about how, how the, the progress of the negotiations and that there right. was a time frame. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and just all that, and it just, man, you know, like, it was just so gross to hear, like, they were, they lied to Janet Reno in order to get, so that they could go forward with their, with what they wanted to do. And, it and just, that stuff was validated later, that was accurate, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, man, like, what a, what a mess. So, so let me ask you this. This may get a little controversial, but we're, we're members of the church. A lot of people look at our religion as a, as a cult. And we, you know, Josh, you and I serve missions and we, you know, we've all seen, you know, people who maybe had weaknesses or trials in their lives, seeing that the things that made them humbled to be receptive to the gospel when we presented it to them or when they were, when it was presented to them or they discovered it in whatever way. Um, Could be watching a commercial or something about the church, walking by a building, finding a book of Mormon, whatever it is. What do you feel is the difference? Because we're looking at, we're not we personally, but society looks at situations like this, that there's a big popular series about it. And we're like, look how creepy, it's a tragedy of course, but look how creepy and weird these people are versus our church. How, you know, someone can discover a ward of the church and have a bishop or someone come up and talk to them and learn about their their history or their, their problems and then offer them solutions through the gospel and then they get on board with it and join. And then they're cons- are looked at by the other, the rest of the world as members of a cult. What's the difference do you feel between the church and the way this situation plays out? Not the way it plays out with the, <laughs> the, the fires and stuff, but you know, how uh, you know, these other cults are, are received or looked at by the world. Well, Ashley, what do you think? Me? Yeah. Um, 
I kind think of a heavy question, but it's, I mean, let's be fair here. It is, a, it is a heavy question. Now my personal, my whole thing is that I, you have a sense of freedom with our religion. People don't look at it that way. People look at, we have all these rules, but in the essence, it's our choice to follow said rules where the Davidians didn't have a choice. It was, you follow these rules or you're gone, basically, you know, and, um, and, he and says that's that. like he tells that to Fib early on. He said, well, after he gets used to it, he's kind of received there. He's like, we, he says, we don't allow tourists to stay here very long, whatever it is. Right. And yeah. he says, you're either have to join, including all the stuff, including celibacy. That's where they have that conversation on the roof, or right. you're going to have to move on. Right. And so I think there's that the option, like, you know, people get. Uh, these rules, you know, they're not, we don't look at them as rules. I'm like, from the outside perspective, they look that we have all these rules in our lives and it's, they say, well, that's too, you know, restricting. You have to do these things, but it's, it, it's our choice. You know, it's our choice to follow them if we want to or not. And we have our personal opinions why we would follow them or why we wouldn't follow them. And, you know, there's those natural consequences or, you know, not even so natural consequences that if you do or do not follow said rules, but, um, oh, rules but like uh i just personally that whole sense of freedom and agency which is so important for our religion and there wasn't any of that with him you and you didn't have it i think that's that's a great great response i think i think you're right and it's interesting how they portray later on and he tells the negotiators they're the women everyone they're free to go whenever they want but as soon as one of them's like ready to go he then he right. completely changes his tone on them and it, and it turns right. into you're either going to walk out of God's greatest test, which is now, this is the trial, and this is how you're going to get yourself in heaven, essentially. And you right. can either walk out and give in, or you can stay here and suffer and burn with us, which is our our test and her our right. That's sick. That's, I mean, that's, it's a sickening thing. And that's a, that's a, that's an infliction on other people. I can't think of anything that the church does by practice or policy that is in maybe restricting to some people's eyes, but not where it inflicts suffering like that. Like there's nothing that we're requested to do. Maybe in earlier times in the church, there were, there were things that were right. happening to them, but I can't think of anything that like someone joining the church has to lose agency at uh, personal suffrage. I mean, I just can't, I mean, discipline, sacrificing habits or lifestyle choices maybe, but like, I, yeah, I mean, it's some, especially something so physically destructive. You know what I mean? Right. I think right. that's, a great, that's a great contrast, actually. Good, good point. But like even with that, though, so like the church itself doesn't have those things, but it depends on who's teaching them and who is there because that person might inflict their own personal belief. And so that's where I feel people really do get, because um, people aren't perfect. No one's perfect. You know, none of us are perfect. And so someone feels like they're really strong, their strong personal belief about something and they'll try and like enforce it on other people. And I think that also has um, unfortunately kind of hurt some situations and put like a bad name on some things too for as sure. well. For sure. Yeah. And I've heard, or, or I've heard recently in several places and conversations about cults, not from this, this show or anything, but the difference between a cult and a religion other than some people make the joke that like your your religion's a cult, my cult's a religion. I mean that's that's not the joke, but or that's not the point. But there, the contrast is that if you have someone that you're worshiping and they're alive, that's a cult. But if they're dead, then that's religion. Situation like this where he's like, I'm I'm a messiah, or you know, we we don't even revere any of the prophets any, anywhere near that level. Even Joseph Smith back in his time, and when they did start to make that mistake, they were they were corrected by the prophet. But even our living prophet who we follow, that's he's not a messiah and he's not elevated higher than us in any way other than his calling is in guidance over the church. Mm -hmm. Said that, I think we criticize, not we, you know, people or not even people in the church, but just in society, criticize people who have beliefs that are just so different than ours that we don't understand why they feel that way. If you hear, like Josh, you mentioned the, 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 com the comment he made about why is it that leaders of cults always end up having sex with many women someone could look at that uh, trend among what well, people consider cults and other people or, but he, watching this show you hear him take on saying that i'm taking on the the um oh, what do you say burden the burden of yeah carnal burden. pleasure 
for on behalf of all the men i'm taking that myself but we also have to procreate and then i was like oh that's just a line until it shows him in bed and then it's like whoa no he according to this portrayal he really felt that regardless I don't feel he did. Whether or not it's accurate or not it's an interesting concept go ahead ashley i just think i don't feel he did i feel he he had his role to play and that meant he still had to play that role with his wife mm -hmm. and so I, I don't think it, I personally don't think it was real because you're, you're going to wait till you're all done to then say that line, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I just like, I'm like, really? Yeah. It's very that was okay. an example. Well, I, was, I, was, <laughs> I was enjoying that way too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But whether, <laughs> like whether or not, however it was done here, I mean, in any other situation, my point is that, you know, you can learn about a lifestyle or a religious, religious practices. <laughs> and you know magic underwear whatever it is without any context or without actually knowing the the feelings and the beliefs of the person that's practicing it anything from the outside can be looked at as a cult-like thing so i right. think i think like you said restriction and and removing agency and all those things that the church definitely does not believe in especially manipulation and there's there that's right. i think that's a key too I don't, people could perceive that missionaries and, and the church can manipulate people's feelings and things to make them feel guilted into religion and upbringing in the church. All that stuff is no different than the way they were manipulated. But where you have uh, the life and death, like Josh said, they weren't causing any, any damage. But when it came down to a, a life threatening situation in the compound, they were very much manipulated that they couldn't leave and it cost them all their lives. So I think I, I think that's another a, another drastic difference. They weren't causing the outside world any problems. No. But that, the, yeah, that's a different. I guess it's a different discussion. Yeah. But. So I have a interesting take on your original question, which was how is this basically how is this uh, this religion different than our religion? Or kinda, any right? any. Any, well, yeah, I think I think the difference really is uh, we have the benefit of 200 years of trying to figure out how this all works within our church. I don't think necessarily that the Branch Davidians. This is going to be controversial, but I don't know if they were that much different than the early members of the church. I mean, think about it. The early members of the church, they left their homes, they all went to these places where they had nothing, and they built lives, and they followed a charismatic leader who, you know, who also happened to be a polygamist. I mean, you know, it's not that much different. The only difference is, is we believe that it's true, just like they believed it was true, right? I mean, so I think the difference between the church now and then is that, or the, the church now in the Branch Davidians is we have 200 years of organized religion behind what we're doing now, and we've figured it all out. They didn't have that. And the thing is, is really the end result is kind of not much different, right? Like the, the governments in their, in their areas thought they were, they were strange and thought they were weird and they chased them out everywhere yeah. they went. And eventually Joseph Smith was shot and killed, right? For, for controversial things. Cause Joseph Smith wasn't perfect either. And you know, he did, he did some things and you know, not only that, but then people just didn't like what, what they were doing. And so that's why I think this kind of struck a chord with me, right? Like, what strikes it strikes it core with me is we all have the right. They say we have the right to to freedom of religion, unless you think that religion is weird, and then everyone's got a problem, right? And and that's what you saw there. These Branch Davidians, yeah, they were weird, and yeah, David Koresh was kind of crazy, but those people had just as much a right to follow that. I mean, you're right. He did manipulate people into staying, but anybody who wanted to leave, he didn't stop them from leaving other than talking to him and convincing him to stay. You know what I mean? He never held a gun to anyone's head. He just said, hey, you know, like you said, he manipulated him. He said, okay, well, this is the test. If you leave now, you know, you're leaving, you're leaving this all high and dry. But he never, if, any, if anybody wanted to walk out that door, they were allowed to walk out the door, right? In fact, they even talked about how a bunch of people left before Thibodeau came, you mm -hmm. know, because of all the things that, that he was doing, all these revelations he had. So those people had had just as much a right to live in some weird, cracked out, you know, Waco community if they wanted to. Yeah, I mean, if that's what they wanted to do, you know what I mean? And um, 
And so, you know, other than the whole the whole idea of him, you know, molesting young girls, I mean, which obviously should have been investigated, but that's not what this was, that's not what this is about, right? And so... I'm saying, because that's um, still up to interpretation of how you look at their lifestyle and within the laws of Texas at the time. So, so yeah, and I think the most telling thing was, was when Steve first started talking to the FBI investigator and he said, and all of this for what? A minor weapons infraction i mean that's really what they were in there for to do and they come in guns a blazing over something like that you know i mean it's really it's it's really telling that um that a government agency can come in and wreak all that havoc i mean i'm not saying that they were the, the branch of videos were completely were, were completely blameless in the situation but i mean that was over to i mean mm -hmm. you know like it seemed like the FBI investigator was like, or the negotiator was like, isn't this a little bit extreme? You know, like, can't we, can't we calm down for a minute? You know, I mean, um, now I have a question for you guys. So at the very end, <clears throat> when David Koresh was quote unquote, interpreting revelations or whatever he was doing that he had branched this. He was going to, yeah, he was going to write out his his yeah. uh, on the seven seals he was going to give right. his interpretation he said it's going to be right. the, blow your mind it's going to be the greatest revelation in scripture ever given he said right right you think that was legit or do you think he was just stalling for time i it seems to me like it was legit it, i feel it, he was legit yeah i think he really he was so he wanted this pedestal right and it, it, in some ways this the, the end of the show kind of reminded me of the end of of the tiger king where where Joe Exotic, where like, he wanted the platform, you know what I mean? Sure. Really, I mean they are. I love they're, that you're tying this together. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> He's on Netflix right now. <laughs> really, all it really came down to was yes, he the way as devoted to his theology as he was. Um, Koresh, not Joe. <laughs> All he, I mean, not all he wanted, but during the negotiations, it started to escalate and that he was looking for a purpose in all of this. And he wasn't letting people go. He wasn't willing to give in to certain demands. He wasn't going to do anything until, and he wasn't going to lead into certain, certain uh, of the, um, the gestures in the negotiations until he found a reason, especially walking out. And he finally got to the point, he was like, wait a minute, I have attention here that I might be able to do something prophetic and critical to the whole world. And he then became just absorbed in his own feelings that he was here for that purpose. I think when he said to them, he wasn't buying time because he was just, he wasn't trying to do anything else. And he wasn't willing to give out the test scripts, not because it wasn't like a Joseph Smith giving out manuscripts when he was translating the Book of Mormon issue. He was just like, I don't want it coming out until it's perfect. And he was just dictating and dictating for a couple of days while they were messing around in Washington, trying to feed up the feed up through the White House their lies. And he was just saying, I want this to come out. And it was just, this is going to be his final thing before he goes to jail. I don't, I think he just wanted to find a purpose in it. He wanted a, a self-fulfilling um, reason for it because he felt like he was a Messiah and he wanted to accomplish something great. And it wasn't about the greatness, but he was like, this is something I can do in these terms. I can say, I want you to do this. And he, he first did his big, you know, blabbering on in, uh, in that one press conference that they, 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 they watched and it was, and everyone was like criticizing all over the news and stuff. And he was watching them say, he's just rambling of a madman or whatever. And he was like, okay, then let me really lay out revelations the way I see it. I think he was absolutely sincere. So I don't, I don't yeah, I, was like, I don't think he was sincere. He was legit in the fact that he's a crazy narcissist who was, you know, slighted by the media and he felt like he needed to redeem himself make it better since his you know recording wasn't accepted so he had to like do something else that's yeah i think that was that opinion. played into it i think when that when that recording wasn't received he was like okay well they need the written word they need they they need something better than just me you know monologuing for an hour yeah i, I don't know i don't know if it was legit or not um but i can certainly understand why after 53 days and he said he'd be done in a week and he won't give them any pieces of manuscript after a week, I can understand why they were fed up. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, I can understand why they think that it's, it's all a game, you know, especially if you don't really know, you know, you don't really believe in 
you know, you don't believe in religion at all, let alone, you know, this crazy cult leaders stuff. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I, I just thought I could get, I don't agree with the way that they handled it, but I, I can understand why they were growing impatient at that point. So the fact- but at the same time, it's like, why didn't he, if it was so important to him, why didn't he do it? Like, why didn't he sit down and type it? He said, well, had what's her name his second wife or not second wife whatever her name was like it type was it with her bloody stump of a hand and he like didn't care i felt like that was oh, like yeah. a such i didn't a realize at first he was, the one that was missing a finger i was like whoa i didn't realize she was the one that was typing i was like oh my gosh how are you yeah doing that? And it's like talk about like a true sense of his actual character you know what i mean like I, I felt that was like an important scene because it shows really kind of who he was for if there if there was any sympathizers for him at that time um watching but it's like at the same time it's like this is a true person struggling with narcissism that is having everything knocked away from him and so he's not going to care who suffers as long as he gets to attempt to redeem himself in his own mind and through my extensive study which i did on one page of wikipedia it said, oh it said he did get shot in the in the torso and in the finger. I think, I don't know if she actually did, but he got shot in the finger. I'm wondering if that was, that they just kind of put that on her so they could show the gore and how he was having, they were having to show how these people's injuries were just developing over time. I don't yeah. know. Let's just talk about uh, anything else about any of the characters or anything else that you thought was interesting. I thought Thib and his, his relationship with whatever her name was, his wife, was really no. interesting. I really wondered. I really oh. was curious. Michelle. Was Michelle, yeah. did you like write this all down, or is your brain just that? I big? did. No, because like I have to like, keep track of names, otherwise I get lost in conversation. So I was like, I'm like, okay, who is this again? So yeah. That's so like me. That's why I had to draw a family tree in order to follow the movie when we watched Knives Out. But okay. anyway, I was like, <laughs> anyway, so so the um the negotiator guy though i just want to say something. Uh, was, i loved him he was so good and general zod was whatever the actor's name is he was michael shannon you believe your son is safe i will find him i will reclaim what you have taken from us michael shannon yeah, yeah i keep thinking whenever i hear that i think shannon mall who played bull from night court Okay. Oh, he was so good. Oh, Richard Mull. It's not Shannon. Or it is Shannon. Shannon Mull? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, anyway, no one, <laughs> no one cares. No, He's no awesome. Cares, but Night Court's a great show. Fantastic. Anyway, so uh, General Zod, <laughs> um, his whole, the whole beginning part with him, because we know how good I am at plot, I was having a hard time following the different incidents that got him on the scene of, uh, of the farmhouse now of the compound now i loved the slow setup of the actual showdown and the and the one part i really liked was the part where, where i got chills actually when they walk the three of them walked out to um knock on the neighbor's door and they were they they wanted to know who they were because they were like who are these people because he went j running with his son the day before and and um david was like we gotta figure out who they are so they walk out there and they were like he wouldn't let them in because they're all set up with their 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 uh, surveillance equipment and everything and they he asked him some agriculture question and he was just bsing him and i was like man this guy is so quick and he stumped him and they walked off and he was like i don't know who they are but they're not farmers and i was like oh my ranchers God. ranchers yeah. Yeah. but i was like this is intriguing now that's where i was like really hooked like where is it what's gonna happen that got heavy at that point and then when he finally goes over there long before he even finds the gun I was like, man, this is this is tense. I was worried about the guy getting in the situation into the compound until he started observing some of the sermons. Then by the time you get uh, the negotiator in on the scene, you were like, wow, here's these two very, very intelligent, very, very uh, charismatic people who are going to be fighting, not fighting, but trying to counter each other, trying to get through these negotiations. I really had no idea what was going to happen. By the time we got to the fire, I was just, I was like, okay, clearly the kids and everyone are going to get out. Or Crash is going to like, you know, throw his cards down and he was going to be done. I had no idea what was going to happen. And uh, the negotiator already being dismissed and he was reassigned. I was like, from when that happened, I already, I automatically knew things were going to get really bad, but I didn't know how bad. But really quick, that moment, 
his monologue as he exited. So good. Wasn't it amazing? So I good. like was like, there it is. Like that's my favorite thing I've ever seen him in ever. I was like, yeah. Anyway. Better than Ben Rosan. I will find him. I don't even know who that is. <laughs> like, what oh, Superman, the Man of Steel. Oh my oh, God. Oh yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I sorry. will find him. Yes. Anyway. Yeah, no, see, cause I didn't, he was a bad guy. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, but he was a bad guy. Like this one, like Michael Shannon's finally playing like a non-idiot. Yes. A non-bad guy. He's actually playing a decent, wonderful human being. Yeah. Who's not perfect, who has mistakes, but he's like trying to do the best he can. I was like that. Thing, yeah. The only thing that matched that was later on when he's at home and he's sitting on the bed watching the news, showing the footage of the, the compound on fire. He's just, uh, just, just weeping yep. in resentment and regret. Not yep. not because he didn't do his best. It was just that he saw it as a tragedy. Oh, and right. then, then right before when they call him in to do, give a statement when they were doing the deposition or whatever, was I guess it's not deposition. You would know, Josh, I don't care. When he was going in to give his testimony, he turns it around and he looks at the kid and the and Thib is just sitting there and he looks over at him and he was playing for him. And I, I really, I was wondering if he was gonna say something. I, I was almost I gonna know. ask him if he, if, he, if he was gonna ask what his name was and then have a right. reaction and then be sad and move on. But he just looked and they just kind of knew. And I don't think the Thib really knew who he was at all. He was never a part of those phone calls, but he, uh, right. You know, he just had this this look of someone who was just completely lost in the world and, and every everything that was his new world was lost. And right. just him looking that the face of this kid was the tragedy. Like that would that re that face represented everything that had happened. But amazing for that was actually my favorite scene. His speech was awesome when he left the tent and he was yes. when they were like, Don't you gotta leave or don't make me have my men move you out. You know, that was really good. But really powerful emotions. That character was really solid. And Yes. Just from that performance makes me curious to read or listen to the book, <laughs> this story. But anyway, yeah. so let's just talk about the ending of the aftermath. But he, uh, the, when the when the farmhouse gets, or the I keep saying farmhouse, when the the uh, compound. Well, I guess yeah, the compound. Before we get to that point, they started doing this other uh, warfare where they were playing the really crazy noises and music at night and all that. The stuff. flashing lights. I can't, what's the name of that, Josh? That, uh, that psychological term, warfare, which yeah. I guess was com Thank you, Ashley. I underestimated you. You're welcome. <laughs> wow. I felt thank like you. it was on the tip of Josh's tongue. This is mm -hmm. he's kind of a, a psycho. So I thought he would know what psychological warfare was. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do it all the time. <laughs> he does it to me. But anyway, he, you know, when they were starting to do that stuff, it was like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And it showed the kids. Can you imagine sitting there with those kids all night, experience going through right. that? And then they shut it off during the day. Right. The soldiers were so far away, they could barely hear. But it was like, oh, it was just tragic just listening to that because right. of the kids. I mean, I mean, the adults is like, hey, you guys are, you guys are kind of in charge here. But these kids and these women trying to bend. That's for the thing. The adults chose to be there. The adults chose to be there. The kids had no say, you right. know, like, yeah. No. And I think that, that kind of leans into the, another one of those cult features or aspects. Right. But, oh, that part, it just got hotter and hotter and hotter of a situation. And then, like, then they delivered the milk, but they didn't have enough power to keep the milk more for than, than a couple of days or whatever. And it was just, oh, this is awful. So then they get to the actual final showdown. And, and what triggered it? I'm trying to remember. They said they weren't waiting anymore and they were moving in. They just crashed in with the tanks, right? Is that all it was? Yeah, so, so they said if you don't, because he told them initially they'd worked out a deal where he would come out in one week if he right. could finish the whatever he was writing. Manifest, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so they asked for some, you know, pieces of it so that they could see it and he didn't give them any. And so they told him, okay, listen, your, your time is up. Either you come out tomorrow or we're going to come in there and that's what they did and so you know i mean i don't know it, it's like that whole situation i just thought was so unfair the way that they handled it i don't know I the don't fbi know. agent mitch uh i would honestly love to hear his opinion on everything like because he didn't care the whole time he didn't care he just wanted to go in there guns a blazing and no matter what didn't care about any casualties or whatever, not even care about the kids. And in the very end, 
he had like his little come to Jesus moment. But like, I want, I would love to know where he's at and like a statement from him, like an apology. Honestly, he was a horrible human being, and I hope he's suffering. You know, Sorry. and that, that's another thing I think uh, I would have liked a little bit more was that. Um, you know, you have to have contrasting characters, right? And you have to have a villain. And he clearly was the villain in the show. Yeah. But I absolutely. bet in real life, he was a little more conflicted. You know, like, because I, mm. can understand, I can understand what he was saying, right? Like, because he, he, that whole conversation he has with the negotiator, he says, every day that we sit out here, there's some other kook out there that is, that is looking at this and realizing that if they can, that, it, you know, that we're weak and that they can do this and we're not going to do anything to them. And it was spending millions of dollars each week or whatever it was. I saw the yeah. number later, but it was right. crazy the amount of money that was invested on standing there while well, just for them to, to, uh, you know, outplay each other with who was, who was going to hold out the line. It was a big game of chicken is what it was. Right. Right. And so I can understand that. And I think that there was a little bit more to him than just an angry guy who just wanted to go and kill people all the time. Now, I don't know his story, but that at the end, when they when the building was on fire and there were controversies about those fires that I didn't really see as portrayed in the show as much as the stuff I read later. Right. But when he was running around trying to find survivors and he ran around to and he was just in tears when he was trying to get the, the one girl out. Mm hmm. I was skipping to the very end of the the incident but like when she was like she was reaching up and trying he could he was trying to get her out but the thing was uh too tight and then she passed out and he couldn't reach her and he was just like freaked out as a character in the show regard i don't know the accuracy of it but i was like oh that sucks that tragedy for the villain was really really well done it was really good because they showed him just of the aftermath shots of him just kind of just kind of looking around and just shaking his head well, they, they did a good job of slow playing that, too, because it was a while. They drop all the tear gas in there, and then he's like, why aren't they coming out? Why aren't they coming yeah. out? You know, like, he's he's slowly starting to realize that he had made a grave mistake. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I agree, actually. He, I think thought, he thought they were just, they were killing themselves. It's like, well, it's their fault. But then it turned into, no, they can't get out. There's something wrong. Because of his actions. He, yeah. he literally blocked off all of their exits. He smashed the bus. They couldn't get out. He blocked off, like he collapsed, like the building. He like beat up the building so much that they couldn't even get out. It was everything was his fault, and yeah, his his whole like suffering thing um, was like, I'm like good, you better suffer. And then the other part of me was like, I hope he takes a gun to his head, like in like his like anguish, which is as I say, I'm a horrible human being, but like I was so angry at him. I was like, this is what you did, just because you were so high and mighty that you refused, you refused to listen and actually do what Gary said. And he actually wanted the he Gary was like the peaceful way, the Michael Shannon character. He was the peaceful way. We talk it out, we do everything we can. Yes, it might take longer than just going in blunt guns blazing, but it's gonna get the best result. We understand these people. And Mitch was just like, no, this is how we're gonna do it. And it's like he gotta see the consequences of his actions. And I just was as much as I felt horrible for like all those kids, I was just I'm glad he got to witness like his that, yeah. horrible choices. Can you imagine the show if it just ended. He's like, well, I guess we just got to cover our butts, you know, and just that was the end yeah. of it. No, he had remorse and it was believable yeah. and well executed. I really like, again, the show as a show, regardless of its actual, it's just like Greatest Showman. It's Greatest Showman is a, a fantastically shot movie, right. regardless of accuracy to real historic events. I mean, if you take right. just Waco the series, it's really good because of those things we were talking about. But uh, right. as a character, I like, is if he's the villain, then you could argue yes. different as or, or perspectives of different um, villainous, villain, villain, villainy from different people. His turn at the end was a very interesting st or step for, or art right. for a villain, really interesting. But yes, I'd want to see the aftermath. I'd want to, they would, if they had a scene with him and his testimony about what was mm -hmm. going on, I didn't need to see Fib or uh, Gary, but like, Having him say something about the reporting would have been interesting, but that would completely dissolve all the controversy that happened afterward. Right. So, so it sounds like you did a lot of research, and I did I did some. But what what was some of the stuff that you that what are your thoughts about what happened after? Because it was years later that a lot of the stuff started getting uncovered. So, what'd you think about all that stuff? Who, who are you talking to? You. You. Me. Oh. Yeah. Well, you sound yeah. like you have a lot of opinion about. 
not just not just how the FBI handled everything, but this was, uh, you know, people expect or suspect that this was a trigger that inspired a lot of other horrible people that did horrible things after this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know much about the aftermath of that. So I, I couldn't really talk about that. I just think that, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's good that this stuff got uncovered so that that way the steps can be taken to make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, I mean, I thought it was really interesting. There was that scene at the end where the, the radio host, well, I don't know if that was, I don't think that that was a real person. I don't know if it was or not, but goes on and talks about all of the different times that the FBI had used tear gas that had turned into fires, mm -hmm. you know, and um, because the narrative coming out of there was, oh, we were trying to get them out and they started the fire themselves for a mass suicide. In fact, that was the first thing that you, you heard. And I, and I can't remember, I can't remember if this came before or after the Haley's Comet, Jim Jones, Heaven's Gate people. I think uh, this was before. I think this was before. Yeah, yeah but Jim like, Jones was later. But yeah, they, you know, having all those things. Heaven's Gate, it was called, by the way. Yeah, that's what I said, the Heaven's Gate people. Oh, I thought you said something. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, to say that there was this like mass suicide to try to cover their tracks, just really just frustrating to me. I don't know. I mean, I, I came away with it just thinking, our government is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ashley? Um, I didn't have any new opinion. I don't like people <laughs> on any side. I feel that like there's so many crooked people, but and there's but there's good people too. And I on both ends. Like I, I wasn't happy with any of the situation. You know, I wasn't happy that those kids had no choice and that they had to suffer the way that, that they did and I was angry that there's crooked people in our government when obviously like the non crooked need to be the ones in power, like Gary. Our, our hero <laughs> that like, got turned away. Yeah. I think it is, so you can really it is very out. important though. I, I think it is very important to realize that of course Gary is going to look great because he's the one who wrote the book. You know what I mean? And like Thibodeau is one of the guys who wrote the book. So of course, if you're looking for just those two perspectives, it's all going to look, you know, it's all going to make us paint a certain picture. I wish there was a book written by the FBI director or by Mitch that talked about right. their view of it too. And that way everything can be objective. Right. That would be nice. But here we are. So. All right. That was my computer. Well, that was one of the, the one things that it was interesting that McVeigh, they actually said he was seen in the footage at the rallies with Waco, Texas that they thought he was, it was inspiring for um, McVeigh for the Oklahoma City bombing, which happened almost, you know, I'm trying to find the dates here, but I think I saw, it was like one day off of the anniversary, like two years later, whatever, of the Waco, Texas, the, the burning of the Texas port. Um, and there were several others that they were like, they thought that this was what in, may have inspired or motivated people to follow through. But yeah, they saw Timothy McVeigh was, from, I'm pretty sure, was uh, actually seen on in press footage at some of those rallies, and that was that was like kind of that's kind of scary. Um, but do you really think it's that cut and dry? I'll ask you, Josh, because I think you're the one that was kind of looking at it this way. For both of you, is it is it that cut and dry that the that they were fine and the FBI is just the enemy that we just no no it's not that cut and dry. It's not it's again it's not that there wasn't stuff that needed to be investigated. There certainly was. But Remedy. I think, the, you know, and, and it's not like, uh, you know, David Koresh wasn't a crazy man. He was, you know, but the, the real tragedy is the way that they handled it that resulted in many deaths that didn't need to happen. Many of which were kids, you know, yeah. and women. So uh, my frustration lies with with that and the politics behind the ATF and the FBI doing what they did, you know, I mean, and the, and I think that this stuff happens a lot more than we, we realize. Yeah. Yeah. And so, 
I don't know. But maybe that's just because the government's making me quarantine. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm really unhappy with all of it. So. <laughs> Well, I know there was a lot of other, you know, controversies or things about the fires. The fire started in the compound in three different places where that they suspect the FBI went, you know, trying to contest that they killed themselves, that they were, that they're the ones that ignited the gas themselves. Um, even though, you know, I think Thib and his, it was either Thib or, or they talked about it a little bit from their conversations, but they were like, no. And the one guy, the one guy left a, a voice, or a, a, a voicemail or whatever, an answering machine message with his, they didn't have voicemail back then, but an answering machine message with his uh, mother or wife or whatever, or whoever it was, and said, no, there's no, we're not trying to kill ourselves, no matter what the right. media says later, we have no intent and we're not even talking about doing that, that they thought it was like a big mass suicide. The one lady that felt that the bait that was under the shelves or whatever, the bed, bunk bed or whatever, that fell down on her, like that was valid, the guy that had to shoot um, Koresh and they killed each other that was accurate um but and then being trapped underneath and it was like it really didn't seem like they were trying to hide themselves but they were trying to escape but the it, there was a lot of investigations came out later that was trying to go back and backtrack all this stuff um the warfare that they were doing the psychological stuff cutting power cutting off food like all that stuff was uh was um all looked at i mean from different sides of whether you do what you got to do or you got to only go so far so i don't know regardless of how you feel about it it's very it's very you know controversial and it didn't paint it as these are bad guys and we had to get them it painted it also as like you gotta see both sides of it and that's why i think it was really right. cool about the show you were looking at the fbi they gotta do what they gotta do but also they shouldn't be doing this and koresh he's got a fault he's got a standard for what he believes in but also you can't kill your people because of your your theology but you know are we that different in our church history like you said josh it's a it's an innocent we've had similar stories in our church with some member of the church who were kind of radicals but i don't know no matter how you look at it it was a well done show really well done and i would say if this was in the theaters <laughs> it'd be a long sit in the theater but i would have given it a celestial rating for sure it's definitely one you want to see but very a very good um drama very good drama to see Kind of makes you think about stuff too and i never like i said i didn't know the story i was hooked <laughs> until the very end then right. i part of me wished i hadn't seen it at all <laughs> it's oh. it happened but uh yeah it's it's heartbreaking but it was, it was really well done really good show is it, am i the only one who looks at that and then i'm like i could start a cult <laughs> his, his uh i was like you know his his sermons and stuff they weren't bad i mean that's I feel that way sometimes listening to preachers and stuff of other churches. Sometimes I, mean, I don't listen to it very often, but sometimes I'm like, I'm, I almost feel guilty. I'm like, uh oh, what happens if I get really, I really enjoy what they have to say? I get like, oh, does that mean I'm, I'm weakening my faith or something? Or is my conviction lessening or something? I'm like, no, no, we're no. supposed to seek all that's praiseworthy and of good report and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then when it's, but then you got to, it's like, hey, when does it start turning? Um, you know, manipulative and, and seeping you into a cult like like he prayed on the one kid. But even that, I don't know if that was praying on it in his mind. So I was saying we don't know we don't know people's hearts. We don't know their real intents. We just know people by actions, but from an outside perspective and limited. So it's hard to judge even what he was really experiencing or what he thought. So it's hard to even say, oh, he's going to hell. Can't say stuff like that. So it's just sad. It is a tragedy no matter how you look at it. Right. Oh. And now this is the part where Tim announces that he's starting the branch, the branch Wildinians, and uh, <laughs> we're uh, well, we're all joining, we're all joining the Tim Wild uh, cult. We're all moving to Colville, Utah, right? No, we're mm -hmm. gonna go north, and we're gonna build a big ice castle that'll look like the Fortress of Solitude. Are you serious? Oh, oh. my gosh, no! We're gonna no, be in like a big nest or a big igloo that's shaped like a crystal castle. Awesome. That's too yeah, cold. You, yeah, you lost me. You lost yeah, me. Yeah, too cold. Too cold. <laughs> Not inside. Because when Lois flies there, he says, Are you cold? And she's like, No, actually, you think I would be, but I'm not. I'm always cold. <laughs> I'd be cold. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, um, thanks for watching, you guys. If you haven't seen Waco, check it out. If you, I mean, we didn't spoil too much because everyone's smarter than me and everyone else probably already knows the story. I'm the idiot that doesn't pay attention to the news through my teen years. Um, He's right. This is the one side now. Right. 
This is the <laughs> one time where Tim is right. Yeah, I didn't follow it. So anyway, really good show though, really interesting. It gets you thinking about a lot of different um, ideas and, and controversies, and it's not about the controversy for sake of arguments and, and the you know division and things like that. It just, it really does make you think about kind of how we look at people. I thought, I mean, I, I have a very critical mind when I think about cults and, and polygamous and things like that. When you hear um, branches that shoot off from the church and, and apostates and things where, you know what? In their mind, it may not be as black and white as it feels like to me. And, you know, like you exactly. said, Josh, there's not a lot that we can, that we should be judging people on because in our history of our church, there's a lot of similarities to what they're doing now versus what we've done in the past, which is not saying that we did everything wrong in the past. But it's just we need to be careful how we uh, how we balance out our, our criticisms. But it's a very good show. And if you watch this, awesome. Thanks for watching. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Ashley, Josh, for joining uh, not Ashley, Josh, but Ashley and Josh for joining us yes. on Saints on Cinema. We'll catch you next time. Thanks. Bye.